Hello and welcome everyone. I am Taklai and uh, my guest today is Fifi. Uh, Fifi is a PhD student in political science. Uh, she has got um, really interesting insights in Ethiopian politics and especially in the ideologies that different political parties um, throughout the, the decades um, have tried to uh, espouse and have tried uh, to implement on, on Ethiopia. And uh, today we're going to discuss about those ideologies. Um, and I think uh, this is one of the least uh, discussed subjects in Ethiopia, uh, largely because we are um, uh, daily bogged down by the events of, of the day. And we haven't had an opportunity to zoom out of all of that and talk about big picture um, issues like the ideologies and the, the thinking, the uh, philosoph philosophical foundation of the, of the regimes and, and all that. Um, and uh, today, uh, we, we will zoom out of all that details and abstract our way and try to give um, uh, talk about those um, ideological um, issues. And uh, I can't think of a, a better person than, than Titi to, to do that with. She's an enormously uh, informed um, um, academic and she's a thinker. I have uh, attended a lot of meetings with uh, Fifi. And I was really, really um, uh, excited uh, to have her on today. It has been a long time in the, in the planning. So I'm really, really excited uh, today. Uh, Fifi, please um, welcome and say a few words. Thank you so much, Tech, for that and for the kind words. I'm not sure they're entirely deserved, but they're very kind nonetheless. And I'm very excited and I'm looking forward to this conversation because I I do agree with you that ideology is among the least discussed aspects of the political changes that have been occurring and continue to occur in Ethiopia. And I think we can't really afford to ignore it. It is deeply connected to reality. Ideology in some ways produces the realities that people now are, are kind of occupying. So I think it's really important to have this discussion and to trace out historical continuities and disjunctures to better understand how we get out of the myriad of uh, political crises that the country and the people within it are grappling with right now. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure, Fifi, and it's more than deserved. Uh, and I'm really um, excited and um, it's my uh, enormous honor that you have taken the time to join me um, today. So um, why don't we start with the with, um, uh, Prosperity Party, uh, Fifi? I think most of the time people don't bother themselves to try to um, study what the um, ideology that the Prosperity Party is trying to, to push, uh, simply because I think uh, it's a party that borders on, on being comical and it generates a lot of crisis on a daily basis anyways. Um, that has meant that people haven't really had the time to think in ideological terms about um, Prosperity Party. And I thought that is a strange place to, to start, I acknowledge, but I think it would be good for us to, um, if we started by saying what um, the Prosperity Party is trying to implement in Ethiopia, if it could, if it could, if it could have things this way and if it wasn't embroiled in war, uh, what I think that would have been trying. Sure. Um, I think this is a very important starting point, especially because of where we are. And part of what is tricky about the Prosperity Party and Abi himself, and I think in this case, the two are really interchangeable, is that there isn't a very clear ideological foundation that can be clearly traced out, at least on my part. So there are policies that have been pursued. Um, kind of in a disjointed manner, but there have been also a lot of reversals and U-turns. So initially, I think the economic turn was what Abiy Ahmed called a, uh, a homegrown economic policy, which he contrasted with the developmental policy of the EPRDF era. And what this signaled to a lot of us was neoliberalism. He promised liberalization both in the political sphere, but also in the economic sphere as well. There were promises to privatize um, state-owned enterprises and really kind of envision a place for private capital, a much bigger place than it, had, it has had previously in Ethiopia. And this has its proponents and this has people who see it as a very dangerous move in a country of what, 110 million people where the vast majority live under the poverty line. But this seemed to be the economic policy that was being pursued 
And I think a part of it comes internally, but a part of it came externally from external donors, from international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank, which showered the Abiy regime with millions and millions of dollars and loans and grants initially, partly because I think they anticipated that he was going to undertake massive liberalization that would profit a number of multinational organizations and states and bring about the change that the international community really wanted to see in the economic sphere in that country. Now, we haven't gotten any details about what this quote homegrown reform looks like and I don't think there's been an opportunity to implement that fully. Um, turns out genocide is really bad for business and the privatization push and agenda has been interrupted by the war and the wars that the Abi administration is waging. So I think in terms of the economic sphere, there isn't really a coherent ideology that is being followed. There is a tendency to gravitate towards bright, shiny things. And particularly in the urban areas, we are seeing this very explicit turn towards neoliberal urban capitalism. We see this investment in these luxury buildings and these hotels that are supposed to be built up. Um, funded by UAE companies. There are a few under, car, um, I think, under contract with American European companies as well. So there is a turn towards urban neoliberalism there, but again, it's not very coherently spelled out. And I do not think that it has a strong foundation that is guiding it. But these influences, these liberalizing influences are very deeply embedded. If you look at his financial advisors, if you're looking at the people who work in the economic sphere, they have espoused this uh, very openly and very clearly. In terms of the political ideology, I think this is where it gets a little bit tricky. I think initially there was an understanding of the PPA and Avi himself as sort of a unitarist force, as wanting to centralize power, as wanting to to really control all aspects of that country. Him personally, um, I think that infamous speech in parliament where he talked about the dream that he had had about being leader and the fact that he sees himself not as the head of the executive, but rather as an emperor or a king ruling over an ancient kingdom, I think gives us an insight into how he views his position politically within that country. But again, I think it tells us very little about ideologically where that stands because we have also seen a reversal of that we have seen some um, at least formal recognition of increasing decentralization in that country. So I think to summarize, I would say the ideological um, sort of foundation has been very, very slippery at best. And I would be very surprised if there was kind of a coherent, well-grounded, well-read vision for the country that they have spelled out beyond these rhetorics of prosperity and greatness, which seems to be like a really extreme force of trying to manifest something where it does not exist. And that much more complex when you're dealing with 110 million people in, in a very vast country. So as far as my reading of it, I think that is the closest thing to an ideology. Uh, I think the PP has exhibited. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Fifi. You've given me a lot of things to uh, to pick up on, uh, and you you made a distinction between uh, political ideologies and economic uh, philosophy or ideology. And if you could focus on the economic aspects for now, and then we will go to the um, political ones. Uh, you you said that on the one hand they were trying to implement what they called um, homegrown policy, as absurd as that is. Uh, but also you you mentioned that, that there was an attempt to liberalize uh, and uh, to well, i think that is a policy that abi has allegedly uh, tried to explain and espouse and propound in the in the medemer book uh, but on a surface reading um as a layman person there seems to be a contradiction in terms uh, between trying to implement a homegrown policy but also to try to um, liberalization, given that liberalization is a tried and tested policy, and there's nothing homegrown about that. Um, am I am I am I onto something here, Fifi? Yeah, I think you're absolutely on to something. And I think 
um, as Abi often does, he has named what he suggested, which are really half-baked ideas and not really a reform, as a, quote, homegrown policy. But this is very much not homegrown. Well, it has had some people that have been pushing for it uh, throughout recent Ethiopian history, but those people have certainly been, in my reading, in the minority. Um, this is a moment of this juncture, right? We're seeing a moment where the economic policy that has been pursued for decades and decades suddenly changes. And this change didn't necessarily organically come from within. There aren't any voices or sort of minds that we can point to and say, well, these are the, the voices domestically that pushed it. It seems to very much be an externally influenced, externally pushed thing. And we have a lot of evidence to, to kind of support that, right? So we know that in October 2019, I'd be told um, the Ethiopian public and the world at large, I suppose, that Ethiopia will receive $3 billion from the World Bank to help strengthen these court reforms. And these were specifically framed as reforms of the traditionally state-controlled economy. So we know that the World Bank, IMF, and major states have traditionally not been a big fan of the state-controlled economy. They do not approve of the developmental state model, particularly in Ethiopia. And so when this person came, rose to power and promised these reforms without necessarily specifying what they were, at least immediately, then these billions of dollars started flowing and we see this huge influx of money, the IMF agreed to a three-year $2.9 billion financing package to, again, support these economic reforms, which weren't necessarily very clear. So despite the claims that this is a homegrown economic reform, we do know that, know that a number of external actors were pushing for it, whether they were you know, the primary drivers of this change or whether they were just really strong sort of incentives, I think it's difficult to say without getting an insider's look into what was happening at the time. And this was a time of instability, right? 2018, he came into power, still was kind of the tail end of the popular protests and uprisings that we had seen. And there was significant uncertainty there, but definitely Ethiopia's economic um, sort of outlook or economic policy that was being pursued rapidly changed at this time. And we can kind of trace that link, like the moment that it changes to when all of these billions of dollars started flowing into the country, partly to support the privatization of what were state-owned industries at the time. So yes, this framing is definitely deceptive because I do not think it originated domestically and was definitely pushed by external actors. Uh, yes. So the, the sense that I'm getting listening to you, uh, Fifi, is that you don't think there is something serious in the so-called um, or, uh, uh, or um, uh, prosperity part of thinking, or also maybe you'll come to that later, that there are um, um, some people who try to kind of make some link between what, whatever it is that they are trying in Ethiopia and the uh, evangelical movement in, in, in the U.S. Um, and I think it's not just you, the consensus among serious thinkers is that there is nothing serious about the about the Ethiopian regime in terms of um, its economic um, policies. Just to the extent that there is one, is a hodgepodge of different things that uh, people are uh, kind of improvising to, to to do. But from time to time, I worry maybe if, if we aren't throwing the 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 baby with with the bathwater. Do you do you do you see or do you say that there could actually be something good that Abiy is trying to implement, uh, but that he's being misunderstood or he's thoroughly um, useless in, in his economic um, um, philosophy? Well, I suppose that depends on how generous ones one wants to be towards him and I think try to try to be try to be generous that's, that's, that's a tall ask that's a very very big ask um so I mean we're all kind of embedded in our own positionalities right and we understand these things and form our opinions of what we deem to be good and not good based on what we believe and our own experiences that we have had so for me it's it's very difficult even if one buys the idea that neoliberalization of the Ethiopian economy is occurring, that urban capitalism primarily, but capitalism writ large is expanding and deepening across that country, right? 
that to me is a very dangerous thing, particularly in a country like Ethiopia where the poverty rates are exceptionally high, where we already see massive levels of inequality. I think deepening neoliberalization, deepening capitalism are very, very dangerous, right? Particularly unmitigated capitalism in the forms that we are seeing today. So I personally think this is negative, but I could also see how if you are a person who believes that Capitalism, neoliberalism, all of these liberalization measures are actually what are required to improve the Ethiopian economy, improve the conditions of life of the people there. I disagree with it, but I can see how from that position, you would find some of the measures that were attempted initially to be quite beneficial. Right. But even if one accepts that these are good measures, that these are good economic policies, the implementation or the lack thereof would certainly give you pause. Right. Even a generous reading would would recognize that the economic condition or situation in Ethiopia right now is very dire, partly related to the genocidal war that Abi is waging, but also partly related to the general mismanagement of the economy. Right, so we see that inflation rates, particularly food inflation, is exceptionally high. We know that a number of industries have simply stopped producing because there aren't enough raw materials to go into it. We know that this, the cities, primarily, because that's where we're getting data from, are increasingly becoming very difficult places for people to afford to live in. And all of these things do not spell out to me an economic genius. They spell out a hodgepodge, kind of incoherent economic policy partly pushed from outside, kind of be trying to be accepted from within that is not producing good results for the vast majority of the people. And again, in any system, you will have a handful of people, a small minority who do stand to benefit from these economic policies. So if you're kind of urban landowners or the urban elite, the, the main sort of demographic or stakeholder group that Abby really wants to attract, perhaps you are having a better time of it now than the rest of that country. But there are also going to be questions of how long do you think this will last? We know that increasing inequality, that economic um, difficulties will fuel a lot of discontent among the people. However, that will be expressed, which then will have an effect on political stability. And then that also has an effect on economic stability. So I guess that kind of a long meandering answer is that, no, I do not think this is a good policy. And even if you think that this is a good policy, you cannot possibly see its implementation as anything close to effective or beneficial in that country. Um, and that's a generous reading. Well, I was, I, was, I was trying to give you an opportunity to, to give the devil is the due, but uh, it doesn't look like you are in the, in the, in the, in the mood to do that. <laughs> uh, but um, next, um, I, what you said that the, the, the Ethiopian economy is in a very dire situation. And I think even the uh, regime apologists would agree with you in that assessment. Uh, but they, they won't put it down to, um, to it being a, a result of a deeply, deeply flawed economic thinking. They would say that the reason Ethiopia is in, in dire um, economic straits um, is because the, the entire world um, has been conspiring against Ethiopia and that Ethiopia has been having to fight against the, all the Western powers. Um, and also um, they would say that the TPLF and all the armed groups in Ethiopia are really Trojan horses for, for, the, for the Western powers so that to the, to the extent that there is economic deprivation in Ethiopia is because of those factors and not because of the underlying um, economic thinking in the country that you said um, doesn't work. Um, so that, that would be their defense. Um, I'm trying to play the devil's advocate here, PP. Sure, sure. Um, so, I mean, it depends on how seriously one wants to take that assertion. It assumes a centrality and importance to Ethiopia that I don't think really exists in the real world. And I mean, we've heard all of these conspiracy theories and theorists really, unfortunately, over the last what, 18 months or so that tell us that all of the country's evils come from external sources and the country is actually perfect and it is doing great. I mean, this is this is ludicrous, right? It just, it absolutely does not make sense. Why would the rest of the world have an interest in ensuring that a country that's not even like a middle income country, it's quite a poor country, still remains poorer. Um, I've heard versions of this where 
Apparently the Americans are afraid that Ethiopia is rising and is gonna become a hegemon and is gonna threaten American power, which I mean, it is very difficult to engage with these trains of thought very seriously because they're so divorced from reality, right? So this is a world that's kind of grappling or grappling with a pandemic, a potentially post-pandemic future and all of these issues and supply chain issues. And in the middle of all of that, the idea that kind of a cabal of world leaders are sitting around trying to decide how to take down the Ethiopian economy, which has quite frankly, a negligible role in the global economic sphere is absolutely comical. If anything, the international community and these institutions have shown us that they have a vested interest in ensuring that Ethiopia stays first and foremost united, and second, a viable, strong presence in the Horn of Africa region. So it flies in the face of everything we know and understand kind of rationally about how the world works, how the global economy works, and it is an attempt to shift responsibility, a complete lack of accountability. And unfortunately, this is not new. This is um, a trend that has continued throughout that country. I think if you're looking at especially uh, accusations of imperialism, which has kind of resurfaced again in a very interesting manner. Now, like in the early days of um, the Derg, this was something that used to be espoused very publicly, right? It's the Americans and it's the imperialists and all of these external forces that are keeping us down. No, we are great. And they are the ones that have kind of conspired to deprive you of everything that you deserve to have. And this is designed for the domestic audience. And I think much of the domestic audience is far too smart to actually buy that, right? And I think what we're seeing is a version of that that's just been regurgitated. But like with most things that Abi does and the PP party is engaged in, it's kind of done half-heartedly, right? So there is an attempt to say, well, American imperialism is, is bad, but please keep us, keep our kind of trade benefits or keep us as part of the Goa and things like that. So even this kind of fairy tale that they allude to, they do not stick to that strongly because there is an indication, a very clear indication that they understand that that's not how the global political economy works. So that's about as seriously as I think I can take them. And I'm afraid that comes across as quite ungenerous, but I think that is the seriousness it deserves. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, I, I, I completely agree with you, uh, but um, I think to, to kind of uh, complete the circle, the uh, my country are wrong, or the committed Abiy supporters of Ethiopia supremacists, as we could call them, uh, would say that the Western world, and especially the United States, harbors some sort of jealousy um, over Ethiopia because Ethiopia is a country that has existed for thousands of years, and it's been mentioned on the Bible or on the Quran forty-four times, and they would say that given that the US is a country that was created only yesterday, um, it has an, an, an incentive to want to destroy Ethiopia. Th those are kind of the, the kind of arguments, if you could call them that, uh, they would present to justify the, or to support um, the um, delusional belief that the, the Western world has been uh, united um, in its um, desire to, to attack um, Ethiopia. Uh, but I think any serious person would, of course, dismiss that as absurd, and that's what you have uh, just done, uh, Fifi. So I, I won't uh, really have any problem that, there. Uh, but in, ter in terms of the uh, Prosperity Party, um, it was created in the ruins of the APRD, um, right? And one of the promises that they made four years ago when, they, when Abiy came to power was that they were trying they, they would only try to fix um, the problems of, of the EPRDF. And um, I think um, there was a time when he said that in terms of the economic policy of the EPRDF, there wasn't much to be corrected. It was only the political aspects of the EPRDF that needed some sort of um, correction. And we'll come to that, to the political um, dreams of Abiy and the political problems of EPRDF. But in, to, to just um, make the point uh, with respect to the economic policy, what would the, the PRD's um, policy and how would you contrast this to, 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 the, to the current regime's policy? And why, I wouldn't say why did it fail, but and the reason um, the whole regime failed was because it didn't really work. Um, so why, try to explain that. 
Sure, that's a, a big question. And I think before we move on from the conspiracy theories, which are always a fun place to dwell in, I think, you know, we this is not to discount the role that through financial institutions, through geopolitical kind of um, dynamics, through direct and indirect influence, through funding that developed states such as the U.S. It's not to suggest that they exert no influence around the world. We know, in fact, from a, a long history, less than illustrious, that they do exert a lot of influence over different countries. And I think what is ridiculous is to suggest that because of the perceived grand history of thousands of years of this country that the United States is out to get us. I think that part of it is the ridiculous part. Um, so just to kind of clarify that. And I think this economic question, particularly the change that occurred between the APRDF era economic policy and the change that was at least promised under um, Abe and the PP is a very, very important one. So I think in the early 2000s, the Ethiopian state officially adopted developmental state ideology. So developmental state ideology was inspired by the so-called East Asian tigers, you have Taiwan, South Korea, and these countries in Eastern Asia that were able to register rapid economic growth in a relatively short period of time through the heavy involvement of the state in the economic arena. So this meant a lot of state-owned, state-managed enterprises. The state and private capital were working hand-in-hand in, hand in these countries to foster development. And this worked really great. This happened in the 90s. And this was envisioned as a possible way forward for Ethiopia. Um, and before that, different policies had been tried, but they had produced very few results. So what this meant in the Ethiopian context was that the state was a central player in the economic sphere, that the state owned some enterprises, that it shared some enterprises with private capital, um, and it invested very heavily in public projects and public infrastructure. Some of them are really visible ones like the Grand uh, Renaissance Dam, um, the condominium projects that were tried in Addis Ababa, implemented actually in Addis Ababa, as well as a couple of different other cities across the country. So very, very heavy investment in public infrastructure, very heavy focus on, um, on roads and bridges connecting different parts of the country, on telecommunications infrastructure, on health infrastructure, on educational infrastructures, all of these supported by public funds through the government and, and constructed to serve the people, right? And so what sets it apart and I think why it drew uh, criticism largely from organizations like the World Bank and the IMF is that they espouse a version of capitalism where the state just kind of takes the back seat where private capital takes the reins and it directs the economy in ways that are conducive or that are that go with the law markets and supply and demand and the invisible hand and all the fairy tales that capitalism likes to tell us, right? Yet what the Ethiopian case demonstrated, particularly with the developmental state, is that there is a place for the state, for the government, in a country with a very low level of economic development, such as Ethiopia, for the government to take the reins, to direct investment, to invest directly, um, and collaborate, ideally, with private capital to achieve. Right. And I think an element of it that was missing that wasn't really as strongly visible in the Ethiopian case as it was in the East Asian case was that this collaboration with private capital was was missing in Ethiopia, partly because private capital was not as developed, uh, just kind of coming out of the 17 years of a war, right? And a part of it was because there was an unwillingness on the part of the government to really meaningfully incorporate and work with private capital. And so whether this developmental state model succeeded or failed, um, that depends on what metrics we are using. So we know that there was very heavy investment in public infrastructure at this time. We know that maternal mortality rates, infant mortality rates declined. We know that life expectancy improved for the vast majority of the, of the residents of that country. We know that economic growth as measured by GDP was really astronomical for a number of years there. Ethiopia had one of the fastest growing economies in, in Africa. And a lot of people do make the claim that some of these figures, such as an 11% annual GDP growth, were exaggerated. And we can allow for that, maybe calculation error or intentional um, exaggeration. But what is undeniable is that there was massive economic development being registered all across that country. So I think in that regard, then it has had many, many successes. Although on the other side, it did have 
significant shortcomings that definitely contributed to the downfall, right? And a part of it was the way in which it was pushed through, right? There was a certain level of kind of authoritarian developmental state and authoritarianism and developmental state ideology oftentimes, unfortunately, do tend to go hand in hand because of the government is the one directing economic investment and directing the direction of the economy writ large. They, there is an exercise of state power that goes beyond what is democratically acceptable. And that was certainly the case in the Ethiopian context as well um, during the APRDF era. And this obviously drew strong criticism from people. There wasn't a consultation process, stakeholders, people on the ground weren't really consulted about the changes that would affect them which again, field a lot of criticism there as well. And I think one of the biggest problems with the adoption of developmental state ideology in Ethiopia is that it is incompatible with the multinational federalism system that the country has had since 1994, right? Because multinational federalism requires a significant level of decentralization Whereas um, developmental state ideology requires a significant level of centralization, I think there is there was and continued to be an incompatibility there that wasn't really resolved by the EPRDF government. I think they leaned towards the developmental state ideology. I think the, I mean, the, the influence of the early days of the struggle is also evident here because they did believe that the economy, first and foremost, is the most important thing that has to be tackled. Then once you resolve the economy issue, once people are able to eat and have places to live and whatnot, then you move on to other problems. Unfortunately, that is not how issues get ordered in real life. And so I think this tension here between the promise of decentralization and the practice of centralization was one of the major factors that led to this particular economic policy not being as successful as it could have been. Um, and of course, there are a number of other issues there as well. But again, you can see how that policy was kind of almost immediately replaced by what was framed as an alternative, although we have very few details on it. And a really prominent part of the developmental state ideology and practice was that it was explicitly pro-poor and pro-peasantry. And so that is what fueled a lot of this public investment. And we know that growth happened with relatively limited in inequality. So oftentimes when rapid economic growth happens, inequality also soars. I believe there's an IMF report in the early 2010s that that was published that actually talked about how inequality was relatively limited given how rapidly the, the the economy actually grew. So it definitely is a mixed bag. It has its successes and its failures. It has its supporters and detractors. Um, and I think history will bear out whether that was a better approach than the approach that is being taken now. Well, I, I think that was an excellent exposition of, of the uh, developmental state uh, model Fifi. Um, and I think you have articulated the, um, the the benefits or the virtues rather of, of that system and what um, we did bring about in Ethiopia. Um, and I don't have anything to, to add there, but I, I'm just wondering if I should kind of um, try to articulate some of the reservations that people would surely have about that kind of system. And uh, I would be really interested to hear um, what your views on, on those um, would be. So I'm not trying to, um, I, I don't want you to defend um, a developmental state. You could do that if you want, but I, I'm going, going to just give you some of the, um, some of the drawbacks or reservations that people, of our listeners will surely have. And the first one, I think um, is that although um, developmental state model uh, brought about a lot of positive things to the country, the benefits didn't accrue proportionally to all people. And that was the reason why the youth from Oromia and Amhara um, took to the streets to, to protest. It was because they didn't feel as though they were benefiting from whatever the, the system was um, uh, producing, uh, right? Although uh, they were, I think any serious person has to agree that they were agitated by, by media, but in order to agitate some people, they should have a reason to be agitated. But, but you can't really agitate a person who is living a comfortable life. 
So th that would be the, the first reservation against that the system that the benefits didn't really accrue um, to everybody proportionally. And the other one would be what they used to call in Amharic Yemaster uh, Sanhakim, that the state didn't really have the right to commensurate with, with the idea that it was trying to implement. It wasn't best place to, to execute the ideas and the policy that that model would have uh, implied. And, and I think that the third would be more kind of philosophical, more abstract, uh, which is the, the debate about who gets to decide uh, how much the state should interfere. Um, and I think they would say that if you had a benign dictator, maybe, yeah, it could work. But if you have people in the upper echelons who are interested by self, um, um, by self interest, they are always going to exploit it by making sure that this, the state had a bigger role than, than was warranted. And in, in, in a situation where there is no mechanism for deciding, how much the state should involve and how much should it kind of back off um, is, is a system that is fundamentally flawed. So what, what do you think about, about those? Maybe I, I haven't really articulated well uh, the, 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 the reservations, but I think uh, you, 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 you'll have um, got the, the gist of what I'm trying to drive at. Yes, yeah, I think I have. Um, and I mean, I, it's good that you said I don't have to defend the developmental state because a lot of the points that you raise are, I think, points that are quite valid. And I think what connects all of them is that they are tied to the democracy question, right? This kind of ever elusive thing in the Ethiopian political sphere, um, unfortunately, but kind of democratic governance would be able to address a lot of these issues. So the first point about benefits not occurring proportionally, I think is a very accurate. Um, it, it's true, absolutely. There are some who wanted the expense of others. There were benefits that were accrued by some segments that definitely were not accrued by others and sometimes were directly taken from others. And especially, I think, a, a central kind of mobilizing factor in the protests that began in 2014 and in a lot of the discontents that were present even prior to that time have to do with land and the question of land grabs and expropriation and displacement that people were facing as part of that efforts of the developmental state. So I think that's absolutely fair that to, to state that, right, to make that statement that these benefits didn't accrue proportionally. Um, now the question then becomes, what is a system we envision in which these benefits would accrue proportionally, right? And I think some of these accounts, um, either honestly or disingenuously, tend to kind of intentionally understate the benefits that did accrue to large segments of the population, right? When you have heavy investments in things like roads and bridges and hospitals and schools, it is the vast majority of the people, particularly the rural people, that benefited from that. Increasing connections means that farmers are, are able to get their produce to the market faster, they're able to get information. Increasing connections between farmers and, and sellers means that that kind of process is a bit more efficient. You have literacy rates, and I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but literacy rates were significantly improved. Maternal mortality rates, as I mentioned before, infant mortality rates significantly declined. And these are just kind of statistics we throw around, right? These are actual benefits. That means that fewer mothers were dying while they were giving birth, which is a significant improvement. When we're talking about life expectancy going up by about 20 years, that's not an insignificant thing. So yes, there were definitely disproportionate allocation or distribution of the costs and benefits of this process, but there were also benefits that did accrue to the vast majority of the people. And I think this has more to do with the fact that it was an explicitly pro-poor policy that sought to address the need, at least in theory, of the most uh, impoverished segments of the population. The second point you raised about is about capacity, and to my understanding, that's kind of a question of, is the bureaucracy efficient enough? And I think that's a question that the developmental state also and those in charge of it really grappled with. And that's why upon the adoption of developmental state ideology, there was heavy, heavy investment in bureaucracy, kind of cultivating the system whereby you have kind of these informed people 
at the regional level, at the sub-regional level, at the Warada level, at the Kabale level, and all of these levels that had an understanding of how a bureaucracy ought to function. And this is a part of the historical legacy of that country, right? That the country traditionally has not had a strong bureaucracy. It has had a very kind of overworked, overtaxed and overtaxing bureaucracy. It has had very weak institutions. So you have to undertake this process of building these institutions. So the question of capacity being related to that was in some ways being addressed. Was it addressed efficiently or quickly enough? No, absolutely not. As anybody who has spent any time in any type of government office in Ethiopia will tell you it definitely is slow and painful, but the problem was acknowledged and the problem was there were attempts to address it there, likely not going fast enough, right? And the last question, the abstract question, I think is, is the most interesting one, right? Who decides really? And I think in Ethiopia, the answer has been the person or people who hold power. They are the ones who decide what path the, the country um, will take. And I mean, that's not exceptional, right? But perhaps exceptional in that they are oftentimes the only ones who get to decide that. Yes, states can certainly put themselves in a position to exploit the people and the economy. But again, I return to, to the point, okay, what is the alternative? What do the alternatives to this policy look like? So the adoption of the developmental state ideology wasn't just a whip. It was rooted in a very long ideological history, in a sort of left-leaning, inspired by Marxist-Leninist rhetoric, which is very prevalent in Ethiopia, has been so since the 1960s, that focused not just on economic growth, but also on exploitation and oppression and marginalization and inequality among people, right? So that element couldn't really be discarded. So that element certainly came into how these decisions were made. Um, again, when we're looking at alternatives, if we're looking for an alternative that addresses these points that you've raised, unhindered capitalism, and particularly neoliberal capitalism, will certainly be worse in terms of how disproportionately the benefits will be distributed. One thing we know for a fact is that deepening capitalization almost always deepens existing inequalities. It makes people who are poor much poorer in relative terms, and sometimes in absolute terms, and it accrues so much benefit to a handful of people. So if you're worried about those who hold state power getting all of this money and resources and influence, then private capitalists getting all of this money and power and influence should be equally, if not more alarming, because they don't have an explicit pro-poor or pro-peasantry ideology that they adhere to. They don't have a concern with inequality because and it's not within the bounds of, of capitalist development, right? So I guess that's a very long answer to say that these points are very valid. But if I were someone who was concerned about these things, as I am, then I do not think that unhindered, unfiltered um, capitalism would be the response that one would give to what should the alternative be. Right. And it's always, I think, easier, and we all do it, to kind of critique the system that was already in place rather than envisioning alternatives. Because in the post-2018 era, we haven't seen inequality getting addressed. If anything, we have seen inequality rising. We have seen inflation rising. Uh, particularly in urban areas, which affects the urban poor most disproportionately. We have not seen necessarily bureaucracy getting strengthened. Uh, we have seen sort of more authoritarianism even within the bureaucracy. And in terms of who decides, it has transformed from a group of people or a central committee to one man making all of these decisions in the economic realm with very little support, with very little uh, kind of backing to, 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 I suppose, defend why these decisions are being made. A man who seems very preoccupied with parks and museums and the aesthetics of things rather than the actual substance of the type of economic transformation that that country needs. Um, and these half-baked articulations really are not cutting it. And we see the result of that, I think, in the economic condition in the country today. Uh, yes. Um, so I, I think, um, Fifi, the, the, the reason why the, the question of who gets to decide uh, remains pertinent uh, is because in the case of um, capitalism or market-led um, economy, um, the, the market 
would take care of everything um, in itself. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that capitalism is is, is an, an alloyed good, or I'm not trying to rise up to the defense of capitalism. I don't think capitalism would would want to be defended by by a guy who lives in a, in a shared apartment. That would be a contradiction in terms. Uh, but I think they they have a po- the people who um, who uh, object to um, a developmental state model have a point when they say that it works only when you have a a, a group of people or a dictator that has the best um, interest of, of the state at heart. But when that is not the case, because they control everything and because they are in charge of making the important decisions, if they get things wrong, it doesn't have an embedded um, way of self-correction. And I think that is a valid um, criticism. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I, I don't agree necessarily, uh, partly because I think the idea of the invisible hand of the market and the market being self-correcting has been proven to be just a myth, right? Markets don't self-correct. Capitalism just blunders on from one crisis to another and deepening crises are opportunities for capitalism to um, enable some to make money and profits and immense amounts of capital at the expense of everything else. And I mean, I guess it's getting very uh, theoretical and abstract. This, This depends on first, whether you think capitalism is a valid way, a good way to organize society. And like fundamentally there, I disagree. It is a system based on exploitation. It is a system based on the theft of labor, the theft of land, the theft of resources. It is a system that has its origins in the violences of colonialism and enslavement and imperialism and genocide. So just there kind of, I guess that's a moral argument as well. I do not think that this is a system around which we should organize any societies, right? And beyond that, beyond these these origins, when you get into the actual functioning of capitalism, who is capitalism at any given time working for, right? Who is it beneficial for? We have seen, like, I look in North America as well, right? Deepening capitalism that increasingly evolves and takes on a different form in this kind of insidious era that we're in is neoliberal capitalism. And you see, for instance, the, the inequality and how far it has grown, not even like taking this long-term trajectory, not even like 10, 20 years, but looking at even the post-pandemic era, how a handful of billionaires were able to make billions of dollars at the expense of everybody else when people lost their jobs and their homes. And this is what capitalism does. It capitalizes, if you'll excuse the pun, on these crises. We saw this in 2008. We saw it, we saw it again in this, in this pandemic era. So that assertion, right, that markets do self-correct, and this is the most coherent way to organize society, that assertion I disagree with. So from that standpoint, then it gets really easy to kind of push back against some of these arguments that, that were advanced, right? So yes, ideally you want a benevolent dictator in a developmental state ideology. That's what Dumbi Samoyo called for. Uh, don't know that it's great that I'm citing Dumbi Samoyo right now, but yes, you you would ideally have that. One could also make the argument that if if the leaders were so benevolent, then they wouldn't need to be dictators, right? They would just simply let the people decide. So there is a contradiction there as well. But this those who occupy state power, you do want them to be interested in addressing inequality, poverty, gearing their policies towards addressing the needs of the poorest population people within that within that given society but if you are a proponent of capitalism who do you imagine will fulfill that role because capitalism is a system centered around the accumulation of capital this perceived endless accumulation of capital in that case the people who make the decision are still there. They have not been removed. They are just people who have absolutely no reason to be beholden to the ordinary people, right? And dictators, even the worst ones, have to at least pretend, right, that they care about ordinary people. But billionaires, they don't have to. And they show us all the time, they don't care about the ordinary people at all, right? So in terms of who decides, it's either the states, or a handful of billionaires. 
right? And both of these can have really dire, really tragic consequences. But if you're looking for a way to have some sort of accountability, to have some sort of influence, a state that is interested in addressing these issues and helping the least well off in that society, I think is your best bet rather than a bunch of disconnected billionaires who owe you nothing and who know that they owe you nothing. And that's the system that we produce. So I'm not saying that state control over resources is a good thing. I think we have seen it's very, very negative aspects. Like I said, dispossession and displacement of people, these land grabs, it's authoritarian way in which some of these developmental projects were pushed through and the ways in which they enriched and benefited certain individuals is absolutely horrendous. And that should be addressed. And it shows us what the problems with this system are. But I think to turn to neoliberal capitalism as the alternative to this, as something that will get us out of kind of arbitrary decision making by a handful of men, and often they are men, um, I think is the wrong way to look at the issue. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that was that was excellent, um, uh, Fifi. Uh, and uh, I uh, I would love, of course, uh, for us to get bogged down in these philosophical details. But I think, um, in the interest of time, uh, also because we have other um, issues that um, I would like us to to cover, uh, we will um, we will move on. But before we do that, to, to kind of add a bit of caveat there. I think that the most um, devout, committed uh, defender of capitalists would kind of make a distinction between saying that um, capitalism has an inherent um, self-correcting um, mechanism and whether or not it actually works, it's a different matter. So in practice, maybe it doesn't work because of one problem or the other, but um, in theory, um, it has a self-correcting mechanism, whereas even in theory, uh, uh, the 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 um, uh, uh, the uh, developmental state model uh, doesn't have that. Uh, but anyways, I think you have made uh, the the case for it, uh, and also the, the case against it um, excellently. And I don't think there's anything to to add. But in terms of uh, Ethiopia, I think uh, you would agree that the high priest of of the developmental state model was Mel Um What in your reading? Uh, was, uh, or do you think uh, Medles uh, philosophy, my economic philosophy was broadly speaking? Sure. Um, just to kind of address that little point, I think it's very interesting because if something is inherent to a system as a whole, you would expect it to operate without exception, right? If it's inherently self-correcting, then it should always self-correct because that is part of, the claim is that that's part and parcel of the system itself. So I think that's a very interesting contradiction there. And I think turning to um, to Medlef and the developmental state, it is really important. I think the role that he played in kind of bringing it to fruition really can't be understated. So what we know from his writings and from his discussions of what other people have written about it is that he really rejected the Washington consensus model of development. And this is because of the influence that um, Marxist Leninist ideology has had during the student revolution and during the 17 year struggle as well, where, you know, there was a, a very kind of critical, radical movement within the country as a whole. And this wasn't exceptional. If you describe, if you describe for, the, for, the, for our listeners, describe briefly what the consensus was. Um, so essentially, the Washington consensus, again, um, deeply connected to um, sort of the capital, I, I keep harping on about capitalism, but capitalism and the capitalist path towards development was, I think, suggested in 89. Um, and so it talks about the ways in which countries, particularly poor countries, can achieve economic development. And it sets out a number of uh, procedures and it sets out a number of processes that these countries can follow uh, in order to achieve development. And these include things that we're familiar with, such as trade liberalization. We see uh, privatization of state enterprises as being suggested as something that's really important. Um, it 
encourages countries, particularly poor countries, to seek foreign direct investment or FDIs. It talks about deregulation, remo removing tariff and non-tariff barriers. So essentially more incorporation into the global political economy, the global capitalist political economy, so as to foster economic development, right? And what Melis rejected was that this Washington consensus could work in the African context as envisioned. And, you know, the, the EPRDF was formed and came into power at a time when the Washington consensus was at its height. It was kind of domineering heights, right? You had to either obey or you get completely rejected. So some of the rejection, particularly initially, wasn't very explicitly stated, but later on came to be explicitly stated. And so the adoption of the developmental state ideology was as an alternative to the Washington consensus of development. It wasn't a complete rejection of the global economy because there was an understanding that at this time and in, in era, you couldn't be the country could exist um, outside of the global political economy, but the specifics that were recommended were rejected by Medlis, and I think um, developmental state ideology presents what the alternative looks like, right, and we have this long kind of influence, ideological influence, but Development was also envisioned not just as an economic process, but also as a political process, right? Initially, at least um, first, in the first phase, would have to be a political process, right? So you have to set up the structures that are necessary to foster and encourage um, economic process in a country like Ethiopia. And I think this was based on kind of um, a pragmatic assessment of the condition of the country in 1991 at the formation or of the, the transitional government and what the needs were and what the capacities were, right? So it was a very pragmatic decision in the early 2000s when they decided to adopt this because another ideology, agricultural development led industrialization was tried for a number of years and this was supposed to bring about industrialization through development in agriculture, but this produced abysmal results. So the turn towards developmental state ideology was adopted at this time and is motivated by the same things that I mentioned earlier, concern sort of for pro-poor, pro-peasantry policy that did not exacerbate the inequality issue that had existed in that country, right? And it centered around sort of the retention of some uh, enterprises in government hands, some were privatized, and the central component of it was the continued public ownership of land. There was significant debate when the constitution was written in the constitutional commission whether the land which had been nationalized in 1975 i believe by the deg should continue to be national public property or should it transform to private property and i think perhaps we'll delve more into this later it's it's such a central part of some of the debates that have been going on and continue to go on today that needs to be addressed. Uh, but broadly, this is where the ideology, to my understanding, kind of stems from and why it was adopted. And the the investment in bureaucracy was seen by Melis, I think, as a really important part of ensuring that this developmental state would succeed. And I think it has to be noted that Melis did it at, at least publicly, see this developmental state ideology being sort of antithetical to democratic governance or to kind of integration of the country or the future, really. He believed that addressing this economic issue would be beneficial, in fact, um, towards fostering democracy. Um, and so essentially, there's kind of a reorientation, right, from this neoliberal capitalist paradigm that was the hegemonic idea in the world to a developmental state model as an alternative. And it's later in, in his life or close to his death really that the global community began to kind of recognize the validity um, of this ideology in terms of producing the types of results that it did produce for the Ethiopian economy in particular. And the Marxist-Leninist influence and the notion of revolutionary democracy, that is a handful of people that make the central decisions within the country, I think, were really integral to how he envisioned and implemented developmental statism in Ethiopia. Uh, yes, so so um, to be precise, uh, I think it was it was called um, democratic developmental uh, state, the, the one that uh, Melis was um, um, espousing. And uh, 
am I right in believing that there were some people who were um, of, of the view that saying democratic developmental state was a kind of a contradiction in, in terms you can't have a state that was developmental but also democratic and I think the Meles spent a, a considerable amount of time trying to make sense of, of, of that. Yeah, I think that's a very valid criticism because like, to me, at least the democratic developmental state, like I don't necessarily use that term because I don't think it makes sense. Um, and even in this articulation, it didn't necessarily make sense. So Meles was able to articulate it quite clearly or articulate his vision of it quite clearly. But they were also, it was used in a very kind of fluid and not necessarily very concrete, precise terms by other folks in the EPRDF. It was almost intentionally kind of ch changing color almost because there wasn't a very clear understanding of what democratic developmental state is. Again, that seems like a contradiction in terms because well, an element of the developmental state is that you have a state strong enough to kind of ram through these reforms and these decisions and these economic directions, regardless of what the people kind of on the ground want, which is in large part the record of the EPRDF era of governance. And I suppose one could envision kind of a world in which democratic norms and not in the kind of Western liberal democracy type way, but at the very basic level, like stakeholder engagement, one could envision a way in which this could be done. And I think sometimes there were attempts to implement this. So for instance, when issues regarding land was raised, you're supposed to have these committees that consult with the people who are facing eviction or expropriation of their land or dispossession. And you're supposed to have conversations with, with the people before you carry out um, these processes. But we know that in practice, these just became ways to tell people what needed to be done rather than to actually consult with them about what they believe ought to be done. So there are, if one it wants to be very, very generous, there are ways to incorporate democratic governance, at least in some limited sense, in this developmental state ideology. I do not think that's what the record of the EPRDF era of governance has shown us because that democratic element of the democratic developmental state was sorely lacking in many instances. Uh, yeah, so so uh, in a nutshell, uh, Fifi, why why do you think the whole uh, Medlis uh, project 